Hello everyone and welcome to the Tradcast, the podcast that connects traditional archery enthusiasts. Today is episode number 9, and on today's show, I'm interviewing Matt Hamilton, co-founder of the Heavy Bow Society, and we're discussing all things heavy traditional bows. This is going to be an excellent show, let's get right into it. All right, everyone, welcome to today's Tradcast, the podcast that connects traditional archery enthusiasts. Today is February 21st, and uh, it's actually probably the nicest day that we've had up here in upstate New York over in over a month, honestly. Uh, temperature right now is right around the 19 degree mark, which certainly isn't warm by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, like I said, it has been very very cold up here this past week has been cold again we've gotten more snow probably another I don't know eight inches ten inches of snow maybe so old man winter just uh, hasn't had any uh, any respite on us so far but hopefully spring is just around the corner and I can start getting back into the woods and doing some more of the things that I enjoy doing I act I am on my way up today though I do want to check a couple of trail cameras that I got my property where I still think some deer are probably passing through that area occasionally so I'm gonna go up there um, check those check those trail cameras I'm also gonna be uh, filming a few other videos here today but uh, I wanted to give you guys a couple of updates before we jump into this week's interview where I recently had a great discussion with Matt Hamilton over at the Heavy Bow Society where we talked all things heavy traditional bows I had a great time talking to Matt. I'm going to bring you guys that interview here in a few moments. But uh, before we do that, I do want to touch on a few updates. And uh, I just, again, I wanted to just remind everybody that the podcast is now also available in an audio only version. And you can find that on podomatic.com, which is a podcast hosting website. If you go on there and search the Tradcast, we'll pop up. You can follow us over there. And you can subscribe to our channel there on Podomatic if you want to listen to it in an audio-only version. Or you can also find the podcast on iTunes now. So if you're an iTunes listener, again, jump on over to iTunes, search the Tradcast, and we should pop up. And we are up to date with all the episodes on the audio version as well. Um, another reminder, if you want to follow our team, Vantage Point Outdoors, in a more regular, up-to-date fashion, you can do that on social media by liking our Facebook page at Facebook forward slash Vantage Point Outdoors or you can jump on over to Twitter and follow us at VPO Pros. So that's how you can follow us on social media. And uh, one more update that I had for you guys this week and that's I got my new Dwyer Longbow. In fact, I got it late last night. I didn't get home from work until real late last night so I, I honestly have only had time to literally unbox the bow and I did shoot I shot three arrows through it last night and I tell you what I am extremely extremely impressed with that new Dwyer Endeavor Longbow I actually have it here in the back seat um, I'm going to be doing a short uh, just a short first impressions video here uh, later on today so if you want to uh, see that video um, look back through our recently uploaded YouTube videos the video should be there by the time you're seeing this and for anybody listening to the audio version if you want to uh, see that first look video or any of our prior, uh, prior videos we have over 175 videos now on our YouTube channel you can uh, go over to YouTube search uh, Vantage Point Outdoors and you should find our channel there and like I said we've got 175 plus videos now on our channel so but I'm very happy with that Dwyer Endeavor. It's an absolutely gorgeous bow. The fit and finish on that thing is... It's absolutely amazing. I did take some good photos of it earlier today. And uh, that, that will be a part of this first look video. And But the pictures, I mean, they're, they're good. But they really don't do this bow justice. It's, it's absolutely just a gorgeous bow. And it shoots... 
I only shot three arrows last night through it, but it's I can't get over how quiet it shoots and just how dead in the hand that bow is. And I'm I can't even tell you guys how pumped I am to be shooting that new Dwyer. I'm going to be bringing you guys some more videos on that as time goes on as I get more familiar with the bow. So I just wanted to give you guys that update also. And um, now we are going to jump over to my recent interview I had with Matt Hamilton of the Heavy Bow Society where we talked all things heavy traditional bows. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a special guest on the line tonight. We are interviewing Matt Hamilton, who is the co-founder of the Heavy Bow Society on TradTalk.com. Welcome to the show, Matt. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, Matt, now tonight on the show, we're going to be talking, we're going to be covering several topics um, in relation to heavy traditional bows. But I wanted to start the show off tonight the way we have every other show. And I wanted to have you just tell us and the listeners a little bit about uh, yourself and how you got started in traditional archery. I'd be happy to, to tell you about that. Um, like most kids, you know, I had opportunities at summer camps to shoot bows and arrows and those kinds of things. And it was fun. Um, I did other types of activities for, for many years uh, that were, um, I liked uh, tomahawk throwing and hatchet throwing and things like that. I didn't get into um, the strict archery until years later when I had a child, and um, we decided that's something that we wanted to do together uh, in terms of learning archery. So it was a great opportunity for my son and I to spend time together, and it became a great time for my son and then wife and I to spend time together. And so we all have bows, and we were uh, uh, you know, shooting them. Uh, a lot of shooting in the backyard, those kinds of things. So it was it was a good family experience uh, for us all. Um, so that's so then I've been doing that now for um, you know, ten years uh, with my and then I branched off into of course hunting, three um, D shoots, um, target archery to some degree, some league, you know those kinds of things. All the things that a person can do if they have an opportunity to have access to a group or a league. So it's a lot of fun, or I just shoot in the backyard. Awesome. So you've got uh, several years under your belt of uh, shooting traditional bows. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I have some really, really good teachers um, that have helped me throughout the years become a better archer, a better shot, uh, and uh, some of them have been close by. I have a friend who's a Texas longbow champion named uh, Jerry Bishop Berger. He's, he's awesome. And then I have a other friend named Rob Green, who's a really great shot. So I've been lucky enough to be around people who are really good at what they do, and they share their knowledge. Um, and then I have friends, it's largely coast to coast, through um, sites like Trad Talk or Traditional Archery Society, um, and also Facebook that I can draw information from and give information from. So I have quite a few mentors out there. And then in terms of the, the heavy bow side of the coin, I also have several mentors that have helped me get to where I shoot those weights well and comfortably. So I had introductory to archery kind of stuff, and then I, as I've gotten heavier and heavier, kind of look at people who do what I do, and I've gotten some really great mentors in that area. Very nice. Now, Matt, you just mentioned about uh, you're shooting some heavy bows, and that's kind of the bulk of what we wanted to discuss tonight. And uh, we want to talk about heavy bows in particular for the majority of the show. And I wanted to start out with maybe having you discuss a little bit about uh, um, heavy bow history and you know, kind of what the roots are when we're talking about heavy bows. Well, if you look at medieval history, uh, you know, we ultimately, nobody knows when the first bow was originally created thousands of years old. But if you look at the medieval history of bows, you'll notice that when there was knights in shining armor or any kind of armor that would be on just a wicker uh, shield, there needed to be some kind of penetration power. So the need to launch a heavy projectile a good distance to be able to penetrate whatever armor, whether it be chain mail or steel or plate armor, they needed to have something that could actually penetrate that. So the creation of the bodkin style arrowhead was was created, which is a uh, three-sided uh, arrowhead because it's armor-piercing. And then what you needed is a heavy enough arrow 
to launch through the air and to using the force of the you know the energy of the arrow and gravity to shoot over a long distance using the arc to ultimately you know dismount a a uh, knight on in armor or kill somebody who is ultimately on the ground. So if you look at battles like uh, Agincourt, where uh, you know the French and the English uh, fought, uh, the, uh, the longbow archers were able to launch very, very heavy arrows at a very, very long distance, and were able to decimate the other side uh, because they could armor pierce uh, the other the other side of the the other uh, army that was engaged. So heavy bows have always been a, a part of that, and then. If you think about it this way, well, then if the everyday bow that they're having to carry is a heavy enough armor, a heavy enough bow they can shoot a heavy arrow, well, they also need to be able to hunt with that. So it could, it had to be a, they had to be able to manage it not only from a long launch, i.e. a flight archery scenario, but also had to be able to hunt with the darn things. So they had to be able to shoot it as a traditional archer would shoot or shoot as a flight archer would, which is to be inside the bow. Very nice. Now, on the show notes, you've I had you uh, construct the guideline for tonight's show because you know a lot more about the uh, the heavy bow side of things. Um, I've got a notation here for uh, to talk about flight archery in particular. Uh, could you touch a little bit more on that? Well, yes. Uh, so, flight archery takes a lot of different forms, and flight archery can be super high technology bow suit shooting very light arrows over very large distances. There's often competitions down in the salt flats for people to do that. Another form of flight archery is more of the English longbow or the English warbow, where again they're using a, a English warbow launching a heavy projectile at a significant distance. And there's of course rules and regulations in the contest just like anything. So there has to be a certain dimension of the bow, there has to be uh, a certain uh, minimum weight of the arrow. And then it's essentially who can launch the projectile the furthest. And I'm lucky enough to have a friend in Marvin Torres, who's a North American flight champion, um, and hold, you know, for time to time can hold a world record in that, that type of um, archery. So if you imagine uh, a group of English people or Americans uh, standing in a line, drawing their bows and launching arrows as far as they can, it's flight archery. It's often just fun to watch the arrow flight in and of itself. So that is a form of archery that people enjoy. It's just launching the arrows as far as they can go and watch them. Yeah, very true. It's actually kind of funny that you mentioned that because I can I can actually remember doing that uh, years ago when I first started shooting with my brother in the backyard. We just kind of, you know, we had a big field behind our house, and I remember we used to just uh, you know sh see who could shoot an arrow the farthest. Um, exactly. Yeah, and it was certainly you know it was certainly a fun thing to do. Well, I was at a 3D uh, shoot in um, Texas, um, uh, the Vanderpool shoot, and there was a group of people that uh, kind of plotted up, and there was a target that was a buffalo that was probably about 80 yards away. And I just realized that there was nobody really ahead of us, nobody in the, the targets ahead of us. So we all kind of standing around there, about 13 of us, and we went, why don't we just take a shot at this thing, you know? And, and maybe it's maybe it's really further than 80 yards. Maybe it was closer to 100. And so a couple of us turned, launched arrows just for the fun of it. Uh, I was lucky enough to actually hit the darn thing. Um, but then the other people who were standing around said, well, that looks like fun. So we all stopped what we were doing, turned. Everybody knocked an arrow, and we just loosed the arrows uh, out there and just watched where they, where they fell. And then we agreed that after that was done, um, whatever arrow you picked up, you had to go find the owner of that arrow, shake your hand, and get to know each other. So it was actually not, it became kind of a fun thing to do, is you didn't pick up your arrow, you picked up another one, and you found the owner. And that way we got to meet more people. It was a ton of fun. But the joy was watching, gosh, you know, it was 13 to 20 archers loose arrows at a target. It was fun. Yeah, I, I can imagine that was a great time. Um, it's... It's and that's the one theme that I've kind of noticed, you know, as I'm kind of getting into the whole traditional archery, you know, uh, community. Is it just? It seems to be that you know that traditional archery just seems to be a great community where everybody comes together and just you know really gets along and is really, you know, takes a lot of pride in helping each other become better archers. Well, 100 percent correct. The traditional group. Uh to me, it's an amazing group. I've made so many friends, you know, near to home, 
and far away through the internet. Um, it, it's amazing the number of people that I've reached that we all enjoy this particular kind of, uh, of sport and share and give. And um, uh, the honesty and integrity within the group is, is amazing to me because people will you know, buy and sell and trade bows and arrows all the time and um, uh, could easily be, you know, scammed in some respects, but the traditional archery people are, you know, red-blooded American uh, honest folks, and we really enjoy um, uh, the, the whole archery aspect and, uh, and, and helping each other out. And then I have friends across the pond there because of my joy of English longbows, and um, lucky enough to have uh, had a uh, Border Black Douglas bow uh, made by uh, Sid over at Border Bows. So it's a uh, now I have a group of friends over you know overseas that I get to uh, uh, talk with, and then we often have deployed uh, armed services personnel that go over there. We can communicate back and forth regarding their trips to those other countries, and they're shooting archery over there. I was involved a while back with sending up some bows and arrows over to some of our troops. Uh, so that they could, uh, when they had off time, go out there and essentially shoot the sand, but they had an opportunity to shoot, and they enjoyed that. Yeah, very nice. Um, I think everybody in the traditional community would, you know, would agree that it's a great community, and uh, that's, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, why we all love it. Um, now, Matt, I know you also want to touch on um, Plains and Native American Indians in short draw with heavy with heavy bows could you tell us a little bit about that well so um i guess the direction to go here is you know there's lots of different types of native americans from all over our land right and i happen to be part chickasaw indian myself so um but as the plains indians trying to take down large buffalo and whatnot they had to have a relatively heavy projectile arrow to be able to take down the larger game so we all know that a perfectly placed shot with a sharp broadhead arrow uh, in the right spot will take down most any animal. Well, you can imagine trying to take down a herd of buffalo, whether you're on foot or on horseback, you're not going to have that perfect shot each and every time. There's way too much action going on. So they had to be able to do a couple of things. They had to be able to ride their horse. They also had to be able to draw a bow. They also had to be able to shoot a heavy projectile. So what you may find in some of the Native American culture is they did essentially a belly draw. Rather than doing a full draw anchor like we often do in traditional archery, they would uh, essentially be able to pull the string only back to their belly as they're also trying to control their horse. So they had to have a really stout bow in order to create enough you know, energy to launch the heavy enough arrow into the animal to ultimately take it down. So... You can, there's all types of bows that, that Native Americans have used. Some have been extremely light into the 40, 50 pound range. And then a lot of the Plains Indians used much more 80, 90, 100 because they were belly shotting or belly shooting them. Yeah, I can certainly see where that would, uh, where that would have been a requirement for them, you know, back in those days. Um, and that actually just kind of sp spawned a question in my mind. Uh, what's the, th what's the threshold for a bow to be considered? Um, a heavy bow. Is there a particular poundage threshold for that? Or? Um, no, there is not. Um, in the heavy bow society, we embrace people who have the desire to shoot a bow as heavy or an arrow as heavy as they can physically do based upon their physicality. Sometimes we'll say, well, one man's uh, floor is another man's ceiling. Right? I'm kind of a stout human being. It's easy for me to draw a relatively heavy weight. So what we are interested in is simply the there's a physical fitness aspect of what we do. There is fun enjoying watching a heavy arrow being cast flat. So it's essentially the heaviest tackle a person can control, shoot efficiently and effectively, is, is what our group is about. And uh, there's a love in that when you see a really heavy arrow hit a target, hit a foam target, or actually hit an animal and the, the impact that it makes, um, you know, there's something kind of fun and exciting about that. Uh, and some of us like that. It's like if somebody was to shoot a 22 caliber gun, some people want to shoot a 44 Magnum. It's just different strokes for different folks. So the Heavy Bow Society is inclusive of all people, 
but we just try to shoot the heaviest tackle we possibly can efficiently and effectively and support each other in that, those types of activities. Yeah, it's so, uh, it, it's certainly a great uh, you know um, a great group that you know that you've got there, and it, and and I can see where that would be handy, like you mentioned before, even from a hunting situation. Um, I just know from myself here, as I'm you know as I'm in, I'm only been in the in the archery in the traditional community now for you know a, li a little over three months, and you know kind of the one common theme that I've you know kind of been hearing from people is that you know you should try to you know at least start out with a bow that you can you know draw and shoot comfortably um but you know i can certainly see where you know having that increased you know horsepower so you know so to speak you know certainly mm -hmm. is going to become handy in a hunting situation when you when you know when you're going to want that penetration power to you know to get in there and and, and do the necessary damage to those animals when you're hunting Right. And, well, you don't need a heavy bow to shoot a duck or a bunny, you know, obviously. And you really don't need anything heavier than a 45-pound bow, you know, by law, uh, to take any game in, in North America. And certainly a good archer with a sharp broadhead doesn't need any more horsepower than that to take down the North American game. It also doesn't mean that just because that's the minimum requirement to take down the game that you may not choose something heavier or more robust. So, you know, in, in often in life, sometimes things are measured by the minimums versus the maximum. And so in this particular group, it is what is the maximum that you can do but still maintain the level of accuracy that we consider to be um, uh, appropriate for good archers. So in the Heavy Bow Society, we actually do have the Board Benders Group, the kind of a joke name. And uh, for anyone under the age of 60, it's to be able to shoot um, an 80-pound or heavier bow at 28 inches and be able to hit a 6-inch pie plate with a group of five arrows from 20 yards. Okay, that's the minimum requirement. Wow. If you're over, if you're over 65, the weight goes down to 70. If you're a lady, I think the weight goes down to 60. And then juniors uh, certainly had to be 45 pounds or 50 pounds. I forget right now off the top of my head what those requirements were. But what people would do is that they would do a video uh, or have another board member, board bender member in good standing watch them do it. And if they could draw the weight, shoot the arrows, hit the target appropriately, then they became a member of the group. So some people took it as an opportunity to exercise more, more push-ups, more setups, more pull-ups start shooting heavier bows to, to see if they could join the group. And so there became a fitness aspect out of that. So and then a lot of the things the Heavy Bow Society and the board vendors in specific do is talk about sufficient uh, different types of exercises that just make us stronger in general. So there is a physical component to this, not a chest beating component, but let's, let's just be stronger. You know, a lot of times we sit behind desks for hours and hours a day. We don't get the exercise that we used to get or would like to get. So practicing out in the backyard with a heavy bow, it's amazing how the muscles involved in that will strengthen your entire body. Back muscles, shoulder muscles, arm muscles, you know, everything, your stance, it all. It all comes into play. You can't draw a heavy bow if you don't have some level of conditioning. Yeah, no doubt. I can, you know, I can certainly see where, uh, you know, like you mentioned, physical fitness would, would certainly become a, a critical aspect of that. Uh. And it would even be a way, like you know, like I said, shooting the bow is actually would be a good way to, to maybe gain some fitness as well. Um, yes, um, as uh, I I I like to personally I like to lift weights. I'm a robust, you know, kind of a thick human being. When I was shooting in the 45 pound range, um, you know, that was good. But as I shot more and more, it just became easier and easier. And um, I just kind of felt like, wow, I could I could shoot with a little bit more horsepower. So I would move up five pounds, and then I would shoot that for a while, and I'd move up five pounds. And, you know, with the tread society being what it is, you know, trading bows back and forth or getting loaner bows or whatnot is just pretty common. And the heavy bow guys, you know, there's not that many of us. And so, um, you know, we started trading bows back and forth, so I started going up and up and up. So then I met my good friend, uh, Leo Markert, um, and uh, uh, through some various websites and phone calls, and he introduced me to what I consider my first heavy bow, is he sent me an 80-pound at 28 um, 
um, Gordy Mori bow um, and let me shoot that. And I realized I could. I was like, well, I'm drawing 80 at 28. This is awesome. So then from there, I just kept trading up, trading up. The heaviest I got to was 155-pound English war bow. Wow. Um, just out of curiosity, what are you what are you currently uh, shooting as you know your primary primary bow? Well, um, I have really around the eighty pound range is what I enjoy the most, um, and so I am like other people. Some folks, you know, I have more bows than I really need. You know, it's always that beware the man with one bow. Yeah, he's probably going to be a better shot than me. But uh, they range mostly in the high seventies to high eighties. Um, uh, right now, and uh, I do have a 120 pound uh, English war bow, uh, and I shoot it, you know, occasionally just to keep to make. If you shoot 120, it makes 80 a lot easier. Oh, I can certainly imagine you know? that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Now, Matt, I understand that uh, several famous archers, uh, you know, were also noted for uh, you know for shooting very heavy bows, and uh, I, I was just wondering if you could uh, maybe elaborate on that a little bit for us. Well. And, and, and that's a good point because, you know, in target archery and a right of archery, Olympic archery, you know, I don't really know all, I, I can only say a few things about that, but obviously, I, I want to put it this way. I have a very good friend who is an Olympic archer and he shoots a 35 pound bow and um, he's really accurate and it's awesome and I love to watch him shoot and, and those kinds of things. So, um, uh, so... Uh, lightness of bow does not also equal accuracy because this man's extremely accurate. If you look at, say, Howard Hill, famous, you know, archer, hunter, hunter first, you know, he shot very, very heavy bows largely because of the game he was going after. In fact, I actually have a, a quote from Howard Hill if I might be able to read it. Would that be all right? Yeah, by all means. Okay. So this quote from Howard Hill says, Why I Shoot the Longbow by Howard Hill. He says, it must be remembered that modern glass laminated bows used today are faster than a bow of the past years. I have always said and still maintain that no person should shoot a bow that he cannot draw with ease. So that's a very important point. He says that no person should draw a bow that he cannot draw with ease. First of all, being a hunter, I wanted a bow that would throw a heavy hunting arrow with as little arc as possible. To achieve this end, I knew I would have to increase the pounds of pull of my bow. I worked towards this result. I started with a bow that I could easily pull. By practicing constantly and gradually increasing the pull of my bows, I developed over a period of years the muscles to pull very heavy bows with no undue strain. For many years, I could handle perfectly bows pulling up to 100 pounds at 28 inches though my favorite hunting weight was between 80 and 90. Then he went on to say that few men have ever spent enough time to develop sufficient strength for handling easily such heavy bows as these. Now, if you look on the Howard Hill website with, um, uh, you know, Craig Egan is a fantastic lawyer whose bows I, you know, I have, you know, it says that even when uh, Howard Hill was 62 years of age, he was shooting a 75-pound bow, hunting bow, with comfort and ease. And he used to practice from 30 to 90 minutes every day, two to three times a week, I should say, using those heavier bows up until the point that he died at age of 75. So, you know, he used it as a physical fitness thing. Now, we all have to know that Howard Hill was a very physically fit human being, very strong, but at one point in time, he actually was able to draw and shoot 172 pounds, uh, which was a pretty amazing feat. But fitness was key. Uh, so if Howard Hill can shoot a really heavy bow and be as accurate as he is, then it's a function of trading, if that makes sense. Yeah, I would I would agree with that, you know. Um, and then if you look at Byron Ferguson, who is, you know, an awesome shot. I don't know if you had a chance to see what Byron Ferguson does. You know, he can shoot aspirin, baby aspirin out of the air. He's in his mid-60s now, and he is still shooting 70 to 74-pound bows for all of his exhibition. So... An argument would be made that, you know, he's a strong gentleman, he's trained, he's done over the years, he's a fit gentleman, and he can use, he can shoot incredibly accurate with what most people would consider a very heavy bow at 70 pounds. Yeah, I've seen some of his videos, and uh, like I said, it's it's pretty amazing to 
to see him shoot and it just it, it almost I mean it kind of baffles me still that that a human being you know with you know just shooting instinctively like that can can be that accurate yeah and look at how easily he draws and holds that that bow and he shoots between 70 and 74 pounds you know uh, it's training it's physicality um, and of course he's an excellent shot so, but it is amazing to me how he can draw that as smooth as other people draw much, much lighter weight. Yeah, very, very true. Um, now, Matt, um, I, I'm just thinking, I mean, you know, drawing these heavy bows, I mean, you know, you know, are there any injury concerns that, that a person needs to, you know, consider or think about if, if they want to maybe start upping the, you know, their bow weights? Yes. You know, as any uh, doctor would, or any kind of company would say, if you're going to start a new fitness uh, regimen, um, you know, consult your doctor. Obviously, jumping from, if somebody's shooting 45 pounds, you start yanking on an 80-pound bow, that's probably not a good idea. Nor is it probably a good idea if you currently bench press 185 pounds to rack 315 pounds on there and see if you can give it a go. So we need to use... Caution, you know, need to be re people with reasonable caution when we do any type of exercise. So, now I will say, often some of the bows that I have shot are a little hand shocky. There's a little vibration going on there. Often kind of make that go away through the weight of the arrow. So there has been, there's some jolt associated with that. So, and I know that Howard Hill bow aficionados or Hill style bow people will say, yeah, hand shock, we don't care. Um, but as long as somebody methodically goes into training to shoot heavier and heavier, uh, does proper warm-up, does proper uh, exercises, then uh, they should have no risk of injury, just like doing any other sport. You should train for it um, and be able to um, uh, perform that sport. So some folks will say, well, gosh, I'm in the blind, it's cold, I've got an 80-pound bow, I'm physically cold, now I'm trying to draw this thing, uh, I'm going to injure myself. Well, but if you've been training for it, no, you won't. You know, but if you decide, okay, I'm going to go up in the tree stand, I'm going to be cold, and I'm going to shoot any bow cold, you could injure yourself. Yeah, that, that, makes any that, sense? that actually, you know, while you were just talking about that, that scenario, I was actually, you know, going through that in my mind, is I was actually thinking of, you know, okay, I'm in the I'm in the tree stand or ground blind, I'm, I'm hunting in mid-November, it's cold out, you know, are there any concerns when, you know, like you said, your body cools down, you get cold. You know, I've dealt with it in, you know, in past years as a compound shooter. And in fact, I can remember one hunt in particular where I literally could not draw my, my bow back on a deer that I wanted to kill mm -hmm. that night because I was cold and I just simply could not get the bow back. So that was just kind of going through my mind as you were playing that scenario out. But, uh, you know, like you said, it just, yeah. you know, it takes training and building yourself up to, you know, to, to being able to comfortably shoot those weights. It's no different than going into the gym, and while maybe your ba your max bench press is 315 pounds, you certainly don't start there. You know, you would certainly warm up. Um, but, again, in the tree blind, you may not have that opportunity. The animal comes up, now you got to draw a cold. Okay, well, if your form is good and your practice has been good, then you should be able to draw the bow and execute the shot without any injury. Right. Now, uh, I know you also wanted to touch on uh, the difference between uh, target weight and hunting weight when it, when it comes to heavy bows. Could you, uh, could, you know, could you expand on that a little bit as well? Well, it's not, um, and this is not, a, I would say target weight is certainly not my area of expertise, and so I'll be very careful as to say that because I'm not as much a paper hunter as uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, hunt game or, or those kinds of things. So, um, uh, I will say that um, uh, to be able to take down an animal, there needs to be a sufficient amount of weight, whether it's a bullet, whether it's an arrow, whether it's a spear, whatever it may be, it has to be enough mass and enough acceleration in order to take the animal down. So I do often see that a great deal of the Olympic archers shoot a lighter weight bow and a lighter weight arrow, Okay, and then that's, that's fine, but there is a bit of difference between when you are hunting the paper target like an Olympic archery and if you're trying to take down an elk. That, the same tackle is not going to get the job done. Right. Um, that yeah, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and that kind of stems into another thing that, uh, 
that I wanted to have you touch on real quick and uh, um, that's you know I, I know you also wanted to dive in a little bit to uh, you know shooting heavy you know is a is a want compared to it being a need um, you know could you expand a little bit on that uh, on that Matt yes I, I can you know in life we, we have wants and we have needs you know we need to eat we need to drink water you know we need those things we don't necessarily need Ferraris you know, we don't necessarily need some of the stuff that um, we have. Those things are wants. So a person who wants to do any endeavor, it's based upon what they want to do. If a person wants to run a mile, great. Some folks say, well, I want to run five. Some people want to be a marathoner. Some people want to be an ultra marathoner. Okay? So is there um, is there a rhyme and reason to it? No, it's it's a want. Uh, it's the same thing as they say, if, if one push-up is good enough to push you away from the dinner table, why would you need to do 10? Well, if 10 push-ups is good enough so that you pick yourself up off the floor, why do 20? Well, why do 50? Why do 100? Why do anything? It's because you want to. There is no need for a person who can, say, bench press 200 pounds to, to strive to be 315, 475, you know, or 400, some, some large number. Those are just wants. So if you enjoy it, do it. Um, so it is simply... It, it is it is in some respects overkill when we know a 45 pound bow with a sharp rod head and a strategically placed shot will take down most game in North America. You don't really need to go over that. You may want to. You may want to shoot a 44 versus a 22. So um, because there's often an, a discussion amongst people, well, you don't need to do that. It's too heavy. You know, and there's a big discussion about, well, all you need is 25 pounds. Well, that's true, but it's not, my, it's not what I want. And if I have the opportunity to do what I want, I want to shoot a heavier arrow. I have a friend named Frank Doman. He says very simply, he says, I like to watch heavy projectiles go very, very fast and hit the target very, very hard. That's what he likes. And I thought that was a really good comment, you know. I like to see a heavy projectile hit, go very, very fast and hit a target very, very hard. Yeah, well, like you said, I mean, you know, it really boils down to, you know, what, you know, you know, what, you, you know, your goals and, and expectations are, you know, as an archer, you know, for your own shooting. Um, now, another thing I wanted to get your opinion on, Matt, is um, for the guy out there that uh, that's saying, well, you know what, I'm going to practice with my, you know, 75-pound bow or 80-pound bow, but then I'm going to go and I'm going to hunt with a 60 pound bow um do you think that's a good thing to do or do you do you think it's a bad thing to do well there's two there's big schools of thought on that and that 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 particular comment there would have lots of uh lots of interesting comments back and forth um i personally feel that when you're in a hunting situation, and I watch Steve Gore and various other hunters and whatnot, and I watch these guys that are very methodical at their hunting and they're realizing how long they're having to hold their their draw uh, while they're really trying to make sure they can execute an ethical shot on an animal. Um, I have realized in my own world that the that I will shoot eighty pounds or ninety pounds regularly when I have gone out hunting with my friend. I've, I've always taken a sixty pound bow with me because I know that I'm not going to be able to execute the shot like, an, you know, I'm the king of my own backyard. We're all the kings of our own backyards. Now, out there in the field, okay, well, ha well, how long am I going to have to hold the shot? How long am I going to be at anchor? All those kinds of things. So if I'm overly strong, then I know I can I can take my time and patience with the shot, hopefully avoid the target panic, and make a good shot on the animal. So I personally, and this is just a personal deal, I believe that if I practice heavy, then I can hunt lighter. Now, other folks will say, well, that kind of tra changes your trajectory and if I have other things. I say, yes, well, you have to practice with both. But the more that I shoot with 80, the easier 60 is. Right. Yeah, that was actually, and in, in just before you you mentioned that last part there about, you know, changing the trajectory, that was actually, again, that was kind of, you know, going through my mind is, okay, well, if I've been, you know, practicing all summer long with my 80-pound bow, and now I'm going to jump into the woods come fall with my 60 pound bow. I would have to assume that there's going to be a considerable difference there in the tra in the trajectory of that of that arrow. Well, if uh, if you if you took a Howard Hill bow for example, and one was 80 pounds and one was say 55, and you appropriately did the same length, 
you know, same characteristics, same lamination, same, 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 and you use the same grain per pound arrow, okay, uh, for the 55 pound bow versus the, say, the 80 pound bow, your trajectory should largely stay the same. Not exactly, you know, but it's going to be pretty close. So, um, but if you turn around and take a, a, a um, if you mix match equipment, and you use a much lighter arrow grain per pound on a lighter bow, well, you're going to have different shot characteristics. You know, clearly, the arc's going to be different. The drop's going to be different. The point on is going to be different. So my personal preference is I draw heavy for the string, and then I, before I hunt, I'm going out, I practice with my lighter bow. I'm going to dial that one in. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's. I, I think the the bottom line on that would be, you know, you certainly want to, Make sure that you're putting in time with you know with both bows so that you're you know perfectly comfortable shooting both those bows and so that you know exactly how they're going to shoot when that uh, when that moment of truth arrives because you know we certainly exactly. owe that you know we owe that to every game animal that we're uh, you know that we're out there hunting. Yeah, the ethical hunter will make sure that what they're hunting with is what they have command and mastery of. I have seen unfortunately too many animals running around with. Um, a pointed stick sticking out of them uh, because people took unethical shots. Yeah, I, I think every I, I think we all could say that, you know. Yes. Um, so with any, you know, if we if we treat traditional archery with the respect that it deserves, and the history with the wonderful history that it has, and we said, okay, well, there are all flavors in traditional archery, um, and this particular flavor of traditional archery is a heavier bow, a heavier tackle. And that's just a part or segment or subset of traditional archery. Yeah, very true. Um, now, Matt, I know you also wanted to touch on, uh, you know, some of the reputable heavy boyers out there and, uh, and you know, cost of, of some of these heavy bows. Um, so could you discuss that? You know, could you, you know, expand on that a little bit with us? Sure, and I don't have the math in front of me, but if you look to say uh, Howard Hill's website, you know Craig Eakins' uh, company, uh, he over a certain pounds, I think over seventy-five, he starts having to charge a little bit extra uh, for two pounds of draw weight because of the materials and effort. I'm not going into it. Um, I spoke to Sid over at uh, Border Bows um, oh, a couple of years ago, and they quit um, making anything over seventy-five because. Um, uh, you know, tethering these things and stringing and unstringing and tethering and I was wearing people out. Uh, so um, I it was blessed. I owned for many years uh, a Dave Johnson uh, hill style bow. You know, Dave's in his 80s now, and he makes awesome, awesome bows. And I had one of the two heaviest that he ever made. Mine was called Moose, and Moose was 80 at uh, 28. And when I talked to Dave, oh, a year ago or so, he was like, you know, I, I, I can't. I'm not making those anymore. I just, I, you know, there's been too much effort stringing and unstringing, stringing these things, you know. So, and I understand that. So there's not that many bowyers out there that will go heavy um, for their own reasons. Uh, some of them may be uh, liability issues because there's a lot of energy being, you know, introduced into something. Um, and then they're, they're a special craft. So you have to look at people like uh, Craig Eakin. You have to look at people like uh, Ken Roloff. We'll have to look at, um, uh, of course, Big Jim, um, and there. Uh, let's see here. I have a Beeler tracker that's a seventy. You know, Dave Beeler made that. There's several. There's Danny Mears out there. There's a bunch of guys out there that will still make them, but it's not the average person, not the average boyer out there that will make a heavy bow. Right. So, yeah. And then, can, and then they do possible extra. Yeah, I, I can definitely see where you know. Where the you know where the stringing and unstringing those heavy bows all the time would, would certainly be a chore to say the least. Yeah. Um, but the flip side is on the on the used market, you'll find that um, you know again that's it's a relatively small group of people who shoot um, heavy or that heavy you know, as a percentage of the populace. So there are bows that were made. 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, Ted Kramer bows, whatever they may be, you know, that, that are floating around there that you can pick up at a very reasonable price for an amazing quality bow in the in the used market because, again, the, the, the supply is there from past decades, 
Yeah, but the demand is relatively low because there's not that many of us out here that uh, that shoot that heavy in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I would I would certainly agree that you know the when it comes to the heavy you know those real heavy bows. I mean, I would say I would certainly agree that it's probably a more of a, a minority than it is a majority. That's for sure. Yes, and for all kinds of reasons, and um, uh, one of the things is is that um, um, I think that um, you know life's a little easier on us these days. It seems like I spend more time behind my desk than I do out chopping wood. For I think a lot of folks, that's a grand grandiose statement, but um, I feel that if I had been my age in an earlier decade, where work seemed to be a little more manual, uh, I'd be a little stronger. So my, you know, other people, you know, Howard Hill's fitness came from being out there and doing it, being it, and, you know, physically uh, getting after it. Uh, so mine has, you know, mine's treadmill and um, a weight machine. So times are different. Yeah, that they are. <laughs> um, now, Matt, I wanted to uh, I wanted to have you also touch on the fraternity of heavy bow shooters and the heavy bow society in particular, the... Uh, the organization that you are the co-founder of. Yes, well, um, my friend Leo Marker, who got me involved in this craziness, and my, uh, my friend Justin Newell and Frank Doman and other ones, and Marvin Torres, an North American flight champion, and a whole bunch of other gentlemen out there that like to, to shoot the heavier tackle. Heck, uh, Steve um, uh, Angle over there at um, uh, Simply Traditional, uh, who currently is now the owner of, of, of Moose, uh, the Dave Johnson bow that I had. Uh, East Fife took on me just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a very close knit fraternity of people who enjoy um, shooting the heavy tackle. Um, we the the parts of it that you know it's unique to each and every one of us. I have a good friend named uh, Forrest Halley who is uh, not a very big guy. Gosh, he may weigh 155 pounds uh, dripping wet, and he had the desire that he wanted to be able to shoot 100 pounds consistently with accuracy and well. So he started training and ultimately at the Heavy Bow Society was created to have a forum to talk about the bows that we shoot, who makes them, how do you get them, what arrow weights, what techniques, what physicality, what fitness regimens you need to go through, and people who ultimately wanted to be in the board, bin, board vendor society um, be able to test out and, and, you know, strive for that. And I think Forrest was a poster child for this. He decided that he wanted to achieve a certain goal, and that goal was to be able to shoot a 100-pound bow, a 28-inch draw, with high accuracy. And so he physically trained for it. And we all supported him in that. Now, I'm a stout guy by nature, so it's much easier for me to that gentleman worked hard to be able to do what he achieved. I'm really proud of him. Yeah, it's, that's certainly so, uh, an the admirable group is very thing. supportive of that. The group supports... Anybody who's doing anything. So the group also supports people who, uh, you know, again, maybe 55 pounds is their limit. That's it. Well, that is their ceiling. That's fine. That might be my floor, but that's their ceiling, and we applaud them for the the efforts they go into to try to be accurate with something that is, you know, the, the max that they can do. And that's awesome. So, you know, the Heavy Bow Society includes everyone, uh, and it always has. And uh, some folks have thought that it was exclusive, and the fact that it's not, it's actually completely inclusive. We want everybody to, to enjoy it. In fact, we often have many posts where people say how much they just enjoy reading about what we're doing. You know, maybe they do ultimately have some kind of a shoulder injury or something that will never allow them to be able to do that. But they're fascinated by the fact that somebody's doing something. And they're good, and that's good, cool, and it's fun, and we all talk. So it is a it's a brotherhood and it's also a sisterhood. We have a really uh, uh, a really uh, the, a nice young lady who uh, she is uh, working up to uh, working up to 100 pounds. Uh, she's currently shooting 80 uh, pounds with the great ease. Uh, very good at her archery. Uh, her name is Alicia, and um, I'm pretty proud of her. And I watch her exploits on uh, Facebook and other sites. And um, uh, she's a member of our society. And it's uh, she's a nice, nice young lady, and really uh, kind of a, uh, a nice, I think, role model for people wanting to strive to do something. Yeah, very nice. I mean, it, it sounds like you guys have a you know a really great 
a great group there, you know, at the Heavy Bow Society. Now, for anybody that's uh, curious about uh, learning more about the Heavy Bow Society and, and, and you know, a little bit more about uh, about what the group does, where uh, where can they go to uh, to find that information? Well, we were fortunate enough that Trad Talk would allow us to have our own forum uh, called the Heavy Bow Society, um, and uh, it's on tradtalk.com, which is, uh, we really appreciate that. And also, if you look at uh, Steve Engel's site, uh, tradition, uh, Simply Traditional, he is a heavy bow shooter like myself, and so there is, uh, well, the Heavy Bow Society doesn't actually have a, a place specifically on there. We all talk about heavy bows there as well. And then if you also look at, on Facebook, for the Fat Stream Society, uh, I think the tagline is when 10 strands is not enough. It's kind of funny. Uh, that's another Steve's uh, uh, simply traditional type of forum, and it's on Facebook called the Fat String Society, and it's people talking about heavy tackle. So there's lots of places to go. Uh, certainly there's a lot of European, largely in the, um, uh, the English, uh, the, the British Isles, that are very into the heavy war bows and those kinds of things to fight. Um, then if you look at a lot of the Asiatic bows and, uh, you know, Mongolian horse bows and whatnot, those, those are often very stout bows, very strong. Um, I've got a friend who's a member of the society who has not only a, say, a 60 pound Saluki, anybody that knows anything about Saluki bows, they're wickedly fast, 240 feet per second. Well, he's got an 88 pounder, you know, that launches a heavy arrow well over 200 feet per second. Uh, and he commands and masters that bow with, with great ease. And it's an 88-pound Saluki. Uh, so um, kind of wrapping that comment up, uh, those are the places in which people who are interested in finding out about heavy bows. So Heavy Bow Society on Trad Talk, certainly uh, Simply Traditional, and also the Fat String Society on Facebook. Very nice. I would uh, certainly encourage all the listeners and watchers of the show tonight to... Uh to check out those platforms. Now, uh, before I let you go, Matt, I've got a couple of questions that, uh, that, I, that, I, that I had asked by a few guys who were, uh, who were, I actually posted on one of the Facebook uh, traditional archery groups that I, was be, that, that I would be interviewing you tonight for the show, and I had a couple questions come in for you. And uh, the first one is from Tyler White, and I'm gonna read his question for you, and I could uh, have you give you, you know, your best answer at that, but uh, he wants to know, I shoot a 68-pound longbow and would like to know how to hold longer and not let my bow arm float. Um, good question. Very good question. Well, first of all, there's nothing better than push-ups um, uh, for that and pull-ups. The stronger your pectoral muscles are, the stronger your back muscles are, the better that is. So the slower you do push-ups, so that you get the positive and the negative aspect, the stronger you'll become. A lot of people can bang out 10 push-ups very, very quickly. Well, once you do the one, it takes four seconds to do just one, and you'll build up an amazing amount of tensile strength or, you know, the slow twitch type muscles. Um, pull-ups are also excellent at that. The other thing is to just, I stand in front of my television set from time to time, and I just draw my bow, and I hold it, and I let it down. I draw my bow, I hold it. I let it down, you know, just over and over again, because I'm just practicing. I'm not really concentrating terribly on form. I'm just working the muscles, okay? I'm not picturing a shot. I'm not doing anything that would then impact my shooting later. I am simply a form of weightlifting, trying to use my bow, and I'll often get a heavier bow than I plan on shooting, and I'll just work that one to make sure that that's nice and easy. Now, don't overdraw a bow. Don't bows mark to 28 inches. Don't be pulling up to 31 that we, you know, stressing your bow and doing things that, that would be irresponsible. Just get a heavier bow and pull it to the appropriate draw length as designated by the bowyer, and that will get you stronger. Very nice. Uh, I'm actually going to, uh, I think I'm going to take you up on that tip and uh, do that myself. Um, I can see where that would certainly... Well, and uh, I will say one anecdotal thing about that, and I'm not telling anybody to switch. Believe me, I'm not telling anybody to switch whatever, but I noticed that when I went from split finger to three under, I became stronger still. So I actually would probably need to set a post out there somewhere asking people, how many people who are in the heavy bow society or shoot heavy shoot split versus three under? I noticed the more that I, when I started switching to three under, I was drawing five and ten pounds more easily than I had the other way. 
So there's something about the physicality, about the way that my muscles line up when I do that, that makes me stronger when I when I do that. But it's a different kind of shooting. You know, somebody's been shooting split forever, don't just start going to three under. I just noticed that, that the physical mechanics made me stronger. Very yeah, very true. Um, I actually I actually uh, when I first started shooting back. Uh, Late October the, this past year, when I first, I mean, my first ever shot with a traditional bow, I, I actually started out shooting the uh, the split finger method because that's kind of what I, you know, heard was most common. But uh, after a few shots, and I switched down to uh, shooting three under, and I just know for myself, I personally like to shoot three under, and that's what I've done pretty much exclusively after the first couple of shots that I ever ever fired off. And I would agree that. You know, from from myself as well. I I just find that I have more more drawing strength holding the bow three under. Yeah, so so that's something that somebody might want to look at. The other thing is, you know, how the bow is drawn. You can some folks will essentially hold the bow arm out and draw the string back using all you know at the beginning you know arm muscles and also the back muscles. Another way to do it is to get within the bow, push the bow arm out. Okay and pull the string back, so now you're using a push-pull method, that will increase the strength of your bow arm, okay? Uh, often archers talk about continuing to push the bow forward throughout the shot. So, not telling anybody to change their shot sequence, but I'm saying that yeah, there's another way to do it. Let's use all the muscles. I certainly don't pull these heavy bows just using my arms. I'm engaging my back muscles uh, from, the, from early on. I, the first thing I'm thinking about as I start drawing back is, am I using my latissimus dorsi muscles? Are they pulling? Am I getting this going? Because arm strength is not sufficient. It's You have tremendous back muscles. They are amazingly strong if trained. So that's why I can shoot heavy. It's because it's the focus on my back muscles, not my arms. So that would be my, my comment to him is shoot more, shoot often, shoot heavy, uh, use responsibility when doing that and practice kind of being inside the boat. Yeah, very nice. Uh, thank you for taking the time to answer that question for us, Matt. Now, uh, the second question I had was, uh, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but uh, I got a question from uh, David Deer King, and uh, I'm going to just you know read his his question to you. Um, he he said uh, he stated, if any are long draw guys, what arrows do they use? I pull 62 pounds at 30.5 inches and shoot 300 spine. And I find 300, shooting 300 spine is just enough. If I went more pounds, I think I'd have trouble finding arrows. What, uh, what's your comments on that, Matt? Well, yeah, and I am not an aerosmith by any uh, uh, way of imagination there. I And my buddies who uh, <laughs> who make arrows for me uh, will clearly know that I'm not smart enough to figure out how Stu's calculator works. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at wood arrows, finding heavy enough arrows and spine can, can be a bit of an issue, but they're out there. Uh, certainly Forrester, Forrester Woods makes uh, really good heavy, heavy spine arrows. I've gotten um, arrows from uh, Jason Eakin, you know, Craig Sam, uh, for my 100-pound bows. They're all sufficiently heavy um, in the wood world. So, also, you know, in carbons, you know, Byron Ferguson has the heavy um, hitters, uh, heavy hunters, I think that's exactly what they're called, uh, and they're heavier uh, there. Uh, the other thing is is that I use uh, the uh, weed whacker line. I often fill the inside of my carbon arrows with a couple of bow strands to gain weight. I'm not a fan of the weight tubes because they bounce around and can knock knocks off, but um, a, the weed whacker line shoved in there can add weight to the arrow. Uh, certainly enough mass up front. Uh, you can also certainly weight the back of the arrow. So there's lots of opportunities there, and then there's footing and all kinds of things that you can do to make those arrows spine properly and be heavy enough to shoot out of a, of a bow, because you certainly don't want to shoot too light of an arrow. You are going to you know, create... <laughs> Great havoc in a hurry. Yeah, when I so, when I read David's long draw, I'm saying I said it was long draw. You know, Howard Hill, that is very tall man, very long draw. It was a struggle for him to be able to find the arrows spying for what he was shooting. So he actually, if you look at his form and how he shoots, he actually moved his whole shooting down to 28 inches. Clearly, I'm not advocating anybody change the way that they shoot. But gosh, Howard Hill, who would normally would probably have about a 31 inch draw. 
you know, made it so that he, he had a 28 inch draw so he could, you know, he could get the arrows that he could get. So just another side of that coin. Yeah, when I saw David's question, that uh, I was like, you know, you, you know, yeah, I can certainly see where, you know, finding arrows would be probably difficult for these, you know, for you know, for these massively heavy bows. Um, well, if you look at some of the, and I'll just pick a brand like Rotex 70, you know, 55, 75, 75, 95. You know, 75, 95, you put some weed whacker cord in there and a heavy tip, and you're, you know, you'd be at seven, eight hundred grains in a hurry. Yeah, very true. Um, well, Matt, we're, uh, we're up on time, but, uh, I had a great time talking with you tonight about heavy bows. I'm sure all the listeners out there and, and watchers of the show picked up a thing or two, which, uh, which might help them and encourage them to, uh, to maybe start shooting a little bit heavier. Um, maybe we can do it again sometime. Yeah, my only comment, and I appreciate very much the opportunity to talk about my passion. It's just realized it is a passion. It's something it's fun to do. And uh, it is not for everybody, but, um, you know, I we at the Heavy Bow Society promote everybody doing archery. Whatever you're doing, it's all good. It's just different flavors for different folks, and uh, we certainly enjoy it. And, uh, again, as an inclusive group, want anybody to be a part of it. Uh, and uh, it's just another facet of traditional archery. And certainly we're no experts in what we're doing, but we are enjoying our hobby as best we possibly can. And uh, we appreciate the fact that there's a lot of people out there that, don't do what we do, but support us in our efforts and our desires, and that's awesome. And we really, really thank those people for that. Oh yeah, and we, uh, you know, we appreciate you taking the time to, uh, you know, to talk about the heavy bow side of things with us here tonight. Um, All right. Well, thank you so much. Okay, Matt, uh, you'll have to fill us in on how, uh, on how your 2015 season goes. You betcha. You betcha. We'll do that. Okay. Right, well, thank you very much for the honor of being on the show. Okay. Yes. Take care. All right, thank you. Yeah, bye. All right, guys. Well, there you have it. Just a look back at my recent interview I did with Matt Hamilton where we talked all things heavy traditional bows. As you can tell in the interview, Matt is very passionate about the heavy bow side of things. He's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to heavy bows. And I'm going to be leaving some links down in the show notes to several boyers that Matt has recommended who specialize in building heavy traditional bows. So if that's something that you're interested in or you want to learn more information about, you can check out those boyers. The links are down in the show notes. And I'm also going to be leaving a couple of links in the show notes also to where you can find out more information about the Heavy Bow Society on Trad Talk and ways that you can get in contact with Matt Hamilton and learn more about heavy traditional bows. As always, I want to thank everybody who took the time to tune in or listen to this week's show. I will see you next weekend on an all-new episode of the Tradcast.